I, I'm going to talk to you today about using the Jasmine Unmanaged Cloud for UKCA training. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the people listed there uh, for their help in, in setting this up uh, and helping me use it, particularly Richard Smith and Matt Pryor at Cedar, who um, uh, it's essentially Richard did a lot of the early uh, work in, in getting the system working. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what uh, UKCA is, um, what the training we do with UKCA is. Um, I'll talk about the virtual machine setting this virtual machine up on Jasmine and then how the training went this year. So UKCA um, is an absolute composition model, uh, which is currently built as part of the Met Office's unified model. Um, and it's important to note that it's not a particular chemistry and aerosol scheme, but it's designed to be a framework for putting different chemistry and aerosol schemes into the UN. Um, and it was originally designed for these long climate simulations that, that have been done. Um, and it's also used for air quality forecasts. So it's part of UKSM1. We use it for kind of ozone assessment simulations. Um, and the whole point of the, the training is to kind of expand on the chemistry schemes that are there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the training that we that have been done in the past, this has actually been run for quite a long time now, I've realized. Um, and there's been various support in the past from NERC and NCAS. Um, it's been implemented at lots of different UN versions. So um, the older versions where we, we use the UMUI and newer versions where we use rose and silk. Uh, and all these, uh, these training materials are still all available on the UKCA website um, at ukca.ac.uk. And essentially it's the same training in every single version, um, which is to create two new uh, chemical species called Alice and Bob. We make emissions of Alice and a reaction to form Bob uh, and a secondary organic compound that then links with the aerosol scheme and then add in some extra deposition uh, for Alice and Bob and then some diagnostic fluxes uh, through these reaction and deposition processes and then look at these uh, diagnostics and some aerosol diagnostics later on. Um, and it's actually quite an involved uh, set of things that people are being asked to do. So adding new chemical species is quite complicated. You're making new uh, input tracers. You've got to uh, make initial conditions for those. You're making up new emissions. So you've got to regrid these from a kind of half a degree by half a degree data set to the model resolution. Defining new reactions and deposition is quite, can be quite involved. Um, working with model output can be quite tricky. Um, so we've got this regridding, working with net CDF files. So there's use of iris in there. Um, and then kind of processing and viewing the model output as well. So it, it takes a few days to kind of go through all the, the different tasks. Um, and you can see here, this is uh, kind of showing what, how these various things go. So taking these emissions from, from one degree, one degree down to, to N48, how these then make Alice look, what Bob looks like after the reaction. So this is the flux through that reaction. Um, the dry deposition of Alice, the wet deposition of Bob, and then what the uh, the, the AOD looks like um, with this change. So, um, it, and it essentially covers everything, hopefully everything that a new user of UKCA might want to do uh, with the model. They might not want to do everything. They might just be interested in adding reactions or uh, adding new species, or it's usually a combination of, of these various things. And we've always held face-to-face -face training in Cambridge in January. Uh, this is partly because it fits around the teaching schedule. It's kind of early on in people's PhD uh, uh, kind of timeline so that it, you get them, you know, people start, we're using UKCA kind of as they start their PhDs. Um, and in the past, we've made use of uh, the Puma service that the NCAS CMS uh, provide and the Archer uh, HPC to run the model. Um, We've had over 120 people come um, from various places around the world. Um, so there's a little map here showing where, where people have come from. Um, and recently, uh, I've also put the, uh, the UN versions 10.9 and 11.8. I also developed them to work on the Met Office virtual machine. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can see from the photos on the side kind of how the environment is. So we're kind of in a 
a kind of undergraduate teaching room in the chemistry department in Cambridge with 24 PCs. Um, and there's a kind of screen at the back for presentations, although when we run kind of bigger events, we use one of the lecture theatres for, for seminars. And the reason we used Puma and Archer uh, is because, you know, superficially, the UM is already installed on Archer. People, people use uh, Archer for their research. It seems like a good system to use for UKCA training. There isn't any technical setup uh, required to get the UM working. It's already there. Um, it's also beneficial for students. They can familiarize themselves with, with using Archer itself. Um, and the UM suites that they'd be using would be similar to the ones they'd be using their PhD. They're the same resolution. Um, they're probably just set to run for a day rather than for, for years, but you know, they're, they're gonna look very similar. But it's not as simple as that. Um, due to the way Archer was set up, compile times were very long. So it doesn't really matter if you're just using the model normally, um, you know, if it takes an hour to compile your UM run, that's fine in the context of it's going to be running for several weeks in any case. But from the point of view of the UKCA training, it was a big deal because actually we have to compile the code quite a lot. Most of what the, the tutorial is about is adding new Fortran code and compiling it. Um, and if it takes an hour for each of those steps, you could only do two or three things in a day and you suddenly find that you, you know, it, uh, progress slows to a crawl. So I had to work out a, a manual compile option, which was to use the login nodes um, for, for that, which worked, but it was a bit faffy. And then you're kind of moving away from Archer being, you know, you're teaching people how to use Archer because it's not an option people would ever use in reality. Um, there are also lots of different accounts uh, that, that people had to use. You couldn't use your normal Archer account for the training. You had to use um, a special uh, training account that, that was provided by the um, Central Archer team. And that's because of the special queues we had, the reservations we had to ensure people could run, had to use these training accounts. Um, often people would have difficulties connecting to or using Archer. So the, then we've got, you know, we're not debugging UKCA problems, we're debugging getting to Archer problems. And this might be to do with the different numbers of accounts. This might be because, uh, you know, Archer might have problems uh, itself and, and just generally everybody had an issue connecting. Sometimes, you know, if we were all compiling on the login nodes, nobody could compile. It was, it was very slow. Um, so it wasn't a great experience. And actually, we had uh, uh, usually the kind of the first afternoon, you'd spend a good chunk of that just going through and, and working out what the problems were connecting to Archer before you could get to, to UKCA. Um, and so this is a kind of schematic of, uh, of how it would work. Um, you know, you'd be, you'd be provided a, a, a login for the Cambridge desktops. Um, usually people who come on in the University of Cambridge, so they couldn't use their own Cambridge account, they'd be given a kind of generic username and password for that. Um, these Cambridge desktops you'd use to connect to the Met Office Science Repository Service. Um, so this is where the kind of code is held and where the, the, the web interface is. So you'd connect to that via, via a browser. Um, you'd also need to log into Puma. You'd use your own personal Puma account to log into Puma, um, but Puma would also connect to Mozers, um, so that, you know, you, you, to, to get the code uh, and make branches and stuff like that for, for, for the UKCA uh, branches. Um, but then you'd also need to go to Archer. Um, you might go, you don't go to Archer from Puma. You might also want to go to Archer from the desktops. Um, there you'd be using your provided uh, training account. So you've got four different accounts you've got to, to manage in this, two of which you've been given on the day on a piece of paper. Um, you know, some of these uh, things might be case sensitive in terms of uh, um, your uh, usernames and that sort of thing. And, you know, so it's not it's not ideal. It's always been frustrating, but it's kind of what we what we live with. For the 2021 course, you know, other than the pandemic and concerns around the pandemic, um, the, one of the concerns was the Archer to Archer 2 transition. So. Um, Archer's been turned off, Archer 2 was turned on, but we weren't sure exactly when that was going to happen, whether the system would even be available. Um, and also uh, last year, uh, there was a security breach that meant two-factor authentication was brought in, um, which made things even more complicated. So it, it was, it, I kind of decided 
that this isn't a suitable system to use for training anymore. It's just too complicated. We have to do too much work actually just getting onto Archer uh, to run the model on top of everything else. Um, so, you know, what other methods, what other ways could, could we do this training? Because, you know, people want to do it every year. There's usually a relatively good uptake for people wanting to, to come and do it. So it's something that we want to provide. Um, and what uh, I'd done uh, a few years previously was uh, develop using UKCA on uh, a, a virtual machine environment that Met Office had kind of set up. Um, and so this was originally designed to work on a, on a laptop or, or a desktop. And uh, it's, uh, it's been set up to use VirtualBox and Vagrant, and it will install everything that you need on a little Ubuntu system to be able to run uh, FCM, Rose, and Silk, which are the kind of required packages the UM needs. Uh, the UM can be compiled using uh, G Fortran, and you can run little test jobs on it, um, none of which were particularly large. Uh, you can find it on, on GitHub there. And uh, with others, I developed a, a kind of cut down version of UKCA that can run on the, this virtual machine system. So um, it doesn't run for very long. It's kind of three model hours, about six time steps. Um, and uh, you can read more about it in that, in that paper there on, on GMD. Um, I'd also ported it to the Azure cloud um, with some free time I'd got on, on, on that system. And it worked really well. You know, you could, you could do quite a lot of stuff with it. It was, it was pretty good. Um, but I hadn't really thought about using it for, for training particularly, although I had some discussions with uh, Richard Smith at Cedar and he, he worked on getting it working on the Jasmine and Managed Cloud. Um, so this is kind of what, I, what we did to the, the, the configuration. We've taken this climate configuration, this climate resolution of, of N96 um, with a high model top. So we've got a full stratosphere in there. We've got, you know, uh, one by two degree resolution um, uh, in the horizontal. And it's been cut back down to kind of M48, L38. So it, it kind of cuts off at 40 kilometers. So it's not great for from chemistry perspective, um, but it's perfectly fine for testing and for uh, training where you know everything's still working you're not really interested in what the results look like and scientifically you'd never use this for um uh for kind of proper research but it's still perfectly good if you want to just test that things are working which is the point of these tutorials and by lowering this resolution cutting the model top down turning off some diagnostic sections turning off a load of output um, we can run this configuration on the VM with just two cores and six gigs of RAM. Um, and in fact, this is the configuration that's used, even, was used even on Archer for the 10.9 training because it was also meant we could run on less resources on Archer. We just need one node per job rather than having to run on, I think, eight nodes we did previously. Um, so, you know, we wanted to then run this on, on Jasmine and, and so while we know this VM could be run on the, on the PC or in the cloud, there were some technical limitations that had to be overcome. So the first one was this use of Vagrant and VirtualBox. Um, so uh, that needed to be changed to work with the, uh, with the system that, that is used on Jasmine. And Richard Smith ported this over into Ansible scripts to allow it to be provisioned on the, on the managed cloud. Another issue is, uh, you've got to have the UM installed. So um, as with Archie, the UM's already there and because CMS have put it on and it's working for everyone. That's not the case with the VM. You have to kind of actually do quite a lot of manual setup yourself before you can even do anything with it. Um, and that's not something I wanted the students to have to do. Um, again, you kind of, you know, you're, you're turning the course from learning how to use UKCA to learning how to install the UM on, on, on the virtual machine. Um, so uh, I, worked out a way of kind of installing the pre-installing the UM and then allowing virtual machines to just make use of that installation. Um, you know, install the required input files. We also have to have Iris installed um, because that's required for, for these emissions tasks and some plotting. Um, and also the Ansible scripts need to be uh, altered slightly to allow for kind of multiple VMs and you know, because of the, the requirement for, uh, or the lack of multiple um, IP addresses, you have to have a login server 
and an NFS server for the for the data volume, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. So for the for the training that we that that we ran uh, earlier in the year, we had 21 separate VMs running on the unmanaged cloud. They were the what's called J4.small. Uh, if you use if you're used to kind of the way the cloud the managed cloud works, which was kind of two CPUs and eight gigs of RAM. Um, and I needed one data volume, so 25 gigs to for the full UM installation that was required. Um, there's one NFS server, there's one login server, and then there were 19 uh, different VMs, all of which were identical. Um, 14 were for students, and then there was one VM provided for each of the demonstrators that was on the course to allow them to kind of debug things and try things out if they, if they needed to join the course. So we in the end needed 42 CPUs and 172 gigs of RAM on the managed cloud on these separate systems. Um, and then once you've got the UM installed on the data volume, you know, you can turn everything off, release it, and then you could always build it back up again in, in an hour or two and do it again for another course. So that the it, it takes, a, you know, about a day or two to kind of install the UM properly and just test that it's installed on the data volume. And once you've got that done, you can kind of expand the system out and bring it back down. So once the course was finished, all the VMs were shut down, the resources was released back to the managed cloud. So it's it wasn't a kind of, you know, it used quite a lot of resource for a week and then, you know, all back, all back to normal again. And so this is kind of the, the system that this is how it looks um, uh, when it's constructed and you kind of go in uh, up from reverse. So you, you make a kind of single VM with this uh, volume mounted, go through the steps to install the UM, uh, test that all the systems are working and uh, put all the documentation on that you want people to look at. So I'd, I'd kind of, I actually developed the tutorials, the kind of the web implement, the web um, documentation for these tutorials on this installation. So I, I kind of went through and made uh, worked solutions, work, sample output and everything and installed it all on this, in, this volume. Um, and so that if the students had a problem during the course, they could always look at my, you know, um, diff output or look at some output files and see how they looked. Um, so once you've made this volume up, you then need to mount it onto this NFS server. Um, and that's then, you construct this NFS server using the Ansible playbook. Once the NFS server is made, you can make the login server. Um, once the login server is made, you can then make all the VMs at once. So um, I've put these Ansible scripts on GitHub here, um, which you can, you can take a look at. And it's kind of got five steps to, to build these. You can build as many VMs as you want. Um, and it will kind of go through and make them all at the same time. Um, and then once you've got them, the students can just connect. You give them, I, I set it up with the kind of unique uh, VM names and, and logins via, so I could work out which student was, was on which machine. Um, and the students could then log in and, uh, and they would instantaneously be able to run the UM straight away as soon as they logged into their, into their virtual machine. Um, so this is kind of how it looks once you're logged in. Um, you could connect it to a number of different methods. So the method that, that Matt suggested was x to go, um, which is Richard was using as well, um, which is kind of free um, way of producing a kind of graphical login. It's similar to the kind of no machine NX service that Jasmine provide, um, but you don't have to, you, you can just set the, the, the license up on, uh, the server up on the, on the VMs. Um, and then download this uh, and install this uh, system. And that works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, so which, was, which was quite good. I tested it with MobileX term uh, via Windows and also kind of a terminal X11 via Mac and Linux. So you could go through a number of different methods dependent on what the students had a, available and what they wanted to, to use. If you want to, you can go on to YouTube. I've got like a 10 minute demonstration video as to how to set up X2Go and you can see uh, it working there. So this is kind of a screenshot from that video. You can see um, that, you know, it's running uh, the, the, the UM. There's a bit of iris going on in the background in, in Python. Um, and we, we're kind of tailing the, the uh, output file to, as the model is running. So it's, uh, it, you know, and what's good about x to go was you can close the window down and come back the next day and everything's still set up exactly where you left it. So it's, um, it was quite useful for students who maybe weren't so familiar with Linux. It was a bit more familiar than, than logging in via a terminal. 
Um, and also the system now is much simpler. So you've got your personal computer at home. You know, these students are uh, sitting as we are all now uh, uh, somewhere. Um, they connect from their personal computer to the, the track pages on Mozers. They connect to the Jasmine Unmanaged Cloud VM that's been provided to them. Um, they've only got to need to remember their Mozers username and password, which is their own. Um, I provided SSH keys to the students to allow them to connect to their VMs, so they didn't even have to remember that. Um, and it made things much easier from everybody's perspective. If the student had a problem, I could log into their, their virtual machine uh, as a kind of ad administrative user, and I could see their output. I could look at what they were doing. So it wasn't quite as, as easy as looking over their shoulder in a computer room, but it was almost as good from that perspective. Um, and, you know, obviously due to the pandemic, everything was done online. Um, so we had these 14 participants. There were five demonstrators at, 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 uh, at various times, usually three or four during any session. Um, we kind of had it as a mixture of self-guided time Zoom sessions, and then kind of sessions where we had Slack support. Um, so rather than kind of having it just via Zoom, people could be having chat sessions in a kind of dedicated Slack uh, workspace. And that worked really well. So you kind of have, you know, threads where people were talking about, I've got this problem, and you could log, log into their VM or have a look at their output and see things. Um, other times you'd have kind of breakout rooms in these Zoom sessions and uh, would discuss kind of similar problems. So we tried to arrange it kind of by everybody's on, you know, task five, uh, everybody's in task six, go to a different breakout room, you know, that sort of thing. Um, generally speaking, I think it worked quite well. Uh, I think people would have preferred to have been in person, um, but, you know, it, it worked for what it was. I think it worked really well. Uh, and in terms of the, the feedback we had on the Jasmine system specifically, you know, this was really, really positive. There were lots of different ways that people connected to their virtual machine. Um, so there was a mixture of Mac, Windows, and Linux. A lot of people used X to go, but we did have people using Mobile X term and terminals to connect. They all found it easy to use. So comparing this to the Archer system where, you, you know, maybe one or two people would get on with no problems. And a lot of other people would have loads of difficulties. Um, you know, it, I was amazed at this, you know, it was it was fantastic. It was this easy to use. It was the sort of thing where it was so easy, people didn't even realize that there was loads of work that went into it, I think. Um, there was one person uh, had a problem cutting and pasting text between the VM and their, their personal uh, computer. But other than that, you know, people didn't, didn't say they had any problems. Um, so I was, I was really impressed with this. I think it was a really good system and it'd be nice to, to be able to be using it in the future, I think, compared to the Archer method. Um, I mean, in terms of the conclusions, I mean, you know, the unmanaged cloud was an excellent platform to run these online training events. It did require a lot of effort, though. I mean, uh, you know, it probably less in the future because all the work's kind of been done in terms of setting the Ansible scripts up. Um, I had to do some kind of testing uh, before Christmas. So there were some volunteers from, from Cambridge that kind of I connected and I kind of gave them some tasks to run through to check if it would all work. Um, and, and, you know, if that hadn't worked out so well, we might have had to think of something else to do. Um, but actually, once everything was done, the experience for the students on the course, I think, was far better than the experience for, for Archer. And because of these Ansible playbooks, we can spin this back up again really easily. Um, and, you know, I, I've, got the, I've got this data volume with the UM installed on. If I needed to run a course next week uh, and there was space available on the unmanaged cloud, I could spin up some VMs and, and do it. And also, you know, we, we could potentially provide a VM for someone if they needed to, you know, weren't able to attend the training and that sort of thing, you know, you could provide a one-off for, for somebody to use as well. So, you know, it's been, it's, I think it's a really good system and it's been, it really was uh, excellent to use uh, last month. And uh, that's, uh, that's everything. <laughs>